Okay, welcome back, Team New Frontiers. <laughs> really, yeah, Team New Frontiers. Really stoked. That's a good Kiwi saying. Means happy, awesome. I'm stoked um, to share a conversation with you all um, and these two fine beings. And, and what, what this discussion is about is... Uh, the influence of art in New Zealand culture, but also culture globally. Um, and it'd be good in this session as well to reflect a little bit around the opportunities that that presents. So um, perhaps just handing over to you both to introduce yourselves and then we'll, we'll take it from there and have a bit of a, a co-creative jam session. Uh, kia ora koutou, I'm Simon Bowden. Uh I uh, was born in Palmerston North, which is about two hours north of Wellington. Came to Wellington when I was 21 to study music. Yeah, pardon me. Um, yeah, I studied jazz guitar at the uh, music, uh, Wellington Conservatorium of Music and then progressed to tour around the country with my band for a few years. Our biggest claim to fame being that we won the Jazz Album of the Year in the, the 2001 music, uh, New Zealand Music Awards. So where's Mark? We could perhaps have a jam later. Yeah, and he's back into jazz. I uh, started a, a jazz festival and then went on. Uh, now I've been working for 13 years as the executive director of the Arts Foundation of New Zealand. Arts Foundation being a private charitable trust, which is unique in New Zealand. There's a lot of those in America, but in New Zealand we don't have any organisations that are not funded by government. So we're 100% private and our role is to inspire people to donate to the arts. So we know a little bit about philanthropy. And um, like Mark, we also have laureates. And like Mark, I get to ring artists up out of the blue. Five a year get 50000 and three a year get $25,000 and I get to surprise them and say, look, uh, we've got some people together and we've been looking, we've been watching. You don't know this, but we've spotted incredible talent and uh, we would like to give you uh, no obligations. You don't have to do anything with it. You could pay off your mortgage. You can invest it in work. $50,000 because we believe in you and they're amazing phone calls. They're made of had tears. I had one person who was silent for a minute. She was in complete stunned silence. Uh, and uh, just recently we've launched a crowdfunding website uh, called Boosted and the main purpose of this crowdfunding website is to help artists inspire and engage with audiences and I think there's uh, quite a huge potential in uh, this particular platform and this digital intervention which um, will change the relationship over time between artists and audiences which we might talk a little bit about soon. Cool. Kia ora koutou. my name is Chris Bailey. Um, I'm a sculptor. Um, I live on Waiheke Island. I have four daughters and two sons. Um, I'm heavily involved in our local marae. I've been carving in the carving shed now for about ten and a half years. Uh, it's been a slow process uh, due to funding and all of that sort of stuff for the timber. <laughs> and uh, um, I'm involved with... Uh, we, I take the periodic detention guys down on the marae too, so I'm involved in a lot of rap bags. Um, so um, all of that, all my creative side is, um, I've, done, I've done reasonably well in it, and I'm finding that a lot of the, um, the rap bags that I work with in the weekends and that um, actually use it as a measurement to perhaps, instead of using sport, or music or anything like that, that they could use uh, their creative endeavours to push out of those uh, poverty lines as well. And I thought, I think that's quite, a, that's been a really interesting observation for me as a sculptor and a um, carver down the marae. Kia ora. Thanks. And um, what you just said touches on something which is really interesting and, and I guess touches a boundary of where I'm really excited about art and the creative industries to be able to influence societies and the environment in really positive and powerful ways and it's um, why I've joined Boosters as an advisor um, to think about how we can nurture um, creatives in order to create um, a, a more equitable society but I'm just wondering um, one of the questions I have for you Simon is you know you've got this depth of experience with the knowledge of New Zealand art and the ecosystem and just wondering if you can give a little bit more specific context of what that looks like and where the opportunities could be um, for the country but but also globally as a result of that. This country is alive with art 
it's uh, I've been I guess uh, following and being in my own practice and watching for about 20 years and it's transformed in the last 20 years when I arrived in Wellington tw over 20 years ago it was a kind of a grey city people said it was a bureaucratic city every two years there was a big festival and it got colour but now it's colourful every day um, there is major institutions producing work all the time. There's artists working from the, the, the beginning levels uh, in student flats. You can go and see shows with two people in the audience and one person in the show all year round, right around the country. It's like a renaissance. It would be interesting to hear if it's the same globally, but it's quite an exciting time in New Zealand at the moment. Um, and, and artists are doing this. Uh, artists are creating this, this, this world um, through their own ambition to create and perhaps we're living in a, in, a, in a really blessed time where there is enough resources for people to do that and enough support and infrastructure for it, for it to happen. Um, not that easy. Sometimes there's not enough money to buy the wood. That does happen, and that happens all the time. Uh, going back a little while, I'm really interested in this conversation about a vision for New Zealand. I think it's extraordinary and how artists can play, uh, play a role in that and how perhaps it might motivate artists to, to connect more. Um, but thinking a while back uh, about when we had uh, Prime Minister Helen Clark um, in the Labour government, before the government we've got at the moment, and she uh, had, a, had a vision for New Zealand. She had a vision for the arts. She, in fact, took the arts portfolio. So we had a Prime Minister saying, I'll be the Minister of the Arts. And the arts rejoiced and it was on the front page and we, you know, we couldn't quite believe it, really. But it came with this dialogue. And the dialogue kind of went a little bit like this. It's OK to be an artist if you're telling New Zealand stories. At the same time, she said, it's okay to be on the benefit, our welfare system, if you're an artist, because it's a legitimate practice, because you're telling New Zealand stories. And for a while, all the dialogue on the arts was, it's okay to be an artist because we're telling New Zealand stories, but it wore thin, because New Zealand artists said, actually, we want to be part of this global community expressing our ideas and connected internationally, not just put into this box of telling New Zealand stories. And in a wider context, the whole telling New Zealand stories and identity started to run a little bit thin. And maybe the vision that we've been hearing about today, this exploration of this, this new vision, this new purpose for the country as an incubating nation, maybe that can be something that, that artists uh, grab hold of and integrate into their practice. What do you think, Rebecca? <laughs> yeah, yeah he, he just said, I know you agree with me. Oh. Um, which I do, and I mean, I, I see um, really there's a couple of two kind of key arms and opportunities for artists and creative industries. One is to create um, the art, the physical works, which inspire and show a vision of what's possible, um, you know, a vision for the future of, of how we can live collectively together um, in a regenerative uh, ecologically rich society and to show that vision and the other is to start co-creating solutions so how can we innovate um, in, in a really creative way the solutions that we have and and I can see that art and and that creative mind is is as much a part as the table as we've just heard earlier as Mark was saying uh, you know it's not just about science it's about social science it's about creativity as far as the problem solving um, capacity goes so um, just wanting to think as well about the inspiration um, which might help catapult us to that place and Chris um, can perhaps you can give us a little bit more background and detail and in, in, into into your practice and what inspires and, and drives you to produce such magnificent work magnificent work right um, at one stage it was pretty much everything everything and everyone everyone inspired me everything I heard music that inspired me, but I didn't do too well. You know, it was a mishmash of, um, you know, uh, of art that people couldn't really relate to. So I, I turned to, um, I turned to, I started finding, I was walking along beaches and that on Waiheke Island, and I started finding flakes, these little stone flakes that didn't look like the natural uh, terra firma of the, you know, area. And uh, through, through asking a lot of old people and that around the island, they sort of showed me that these, this, the flakes I was finding were all these old ancient adzes from the people that used to live there in bygone eras. And they started showing me all these flakes that they found and these, these guys were in their 70s and that. And I was really taken back by the form of these old edges and um, 
the function of them, what, what did they do, why were they being made. And then um, around about the same time, I, I decided that you know, I wasn't dumb because we found out that our boy was dyslexic and I related to it. I went, oh, geez, all these years, I've just been dyslexic, man, you know, issues with reading and writing. So I went to university and I thought, oh, this is going to be easy. I'll just take all the Māori papers. <laughs> and then it was like uh, grammatical papers, reading and writing. And so, you know, um, my sweetheart at the time, Sally, she basically read them all out to me. And I got them and I passed them. And she learned how to speak Māori. She's a Parker woman, yeah. Sally Smith. She's, she's really awesome. At the same time that I was doing these papers, I bumped into a guy called Dante Bonica, who was the he was in the he was a Sicilian he's a Sicilian professor, and he was whangaied into the Ngāti Kahununu tribe. And his papers were material culture, so we spent um, I spent a lot of time with him learning the methodology of ancient tool making techniques, and that really kicked off my inspiration for once I've once I've completed all those papers, basically, from then till now, it's all about my creative endeavours have been about understanding and grabbing archaeological um, digs and pieces and putting contemporary twists on them and delivering them into, into now with a contemporary angle. And um, the process is, is quite long, you know, but it's good. Really good. And I've found, you know, that uh, once I started pushing out of traditional, um, traditional forms and concepts and going more universal, um, I got even, they were even loved even more, you know. So that's, that was, that's been a real good eye-opener as well. So going into, I think we were talking earlier on the universal language of form, so there's been a few um, there's been a few uh, stone symposiums I've been involved in the Sydney Sculpture by the Sea and um, a few other ones like that and people that don't speak English the Japanese sculptors and Arabic a lot of, a lot of people that just don't speak English is not their first language the first thing they get is the universal language so they walk around instead of having to read a book about it it just kicks them in the stomach you know. They don't have to try and work it out. And I think what we were talking about before, we were talking about mathematics being a universal language and, and physics and, and all of these things. I think there's definitely a creative one as well. Yeah. And, I, and I like that, that the creative one and um, what connects, you know, pulling, pulling um, the assets from the past and projecting them into the future. Um, and I can see that the common thread of what allows you to do that is beauty and that language of beauty um, and how yeah. it touches people universally in such yeah. a powerful way. Um, Sorry. Yeah, I've discovered that, um, and I watched it on, the, on a documentary actually about beautiful. All these chicks were, uh, all these women were um, seen as beautiful and what made them beautiful. And the, all the photographers and everything were saying, well, symmetrical faces are beautiful, blah, 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 you know. So, the, you know, um, I took it back to um, Professor Dante Bonica and he was saying, yeah, but there's, it's the same with uh, a lot of the archaeological forms. They had symmetri symmetricality to them so that they could function better. Um, and there was, there's a real, there was a real, I discovered there's a fine line between functionality and beauty, like a lot of the artefacts you see, actually quite beautiful in themselves, um, but they have a function. You know, they have a real function. One of my favourites is the, um, they call it a hogback adz, type 1, 5, I think the archaeologists call them. And um, they were primarily used to start a lot of the waka or, the, the, or to engage in the front of the hull, the inside of the holes and the backs of the holes because of the shape. And... Um, they're really quite beautiful to look at. Real, you can almost see them. They have a, you could use them. They're aerodynamic, you know. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's just something that sort of blows my pupil up, so to speak, <laughs> <laughs> creatively. Yeah. It's a pupil. 
A pupu, a pupu is, is the um, flax skirts that the Tai Tamariki were. Uh, as another Kiwi colloquial yeah, yeah. saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Of, I have a dry sense of humour. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a ton of more questions and reflections for you guys, but I'd really like to give um, the opportunity um, to open things up in a co-creation session, so just welcome questions, reflections. Um, well, I'm excited to hear your observations, Chris, about um, uh, Maori artists being a, a channel for lifting people out of poverty because I live in a place in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, mm. where there has been a huge uh, evolution over the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years of an annual arts market that actually has helped a lot of native people of that area. Um, and, and many of them earn their whole year's wages in one weekend. Um, yep. And so that's exciting to me. But what I was curious to ask all three of you, in a sense, is um, I, I'm fascinated with the role of arts for transforming culture. And uh, I heard a story from a friend who went to Berlin, and she was an art dealer, actually, and she was stunned by the public art in Berlin and how it's been used and very systematically supported in the interest of cultural healing and advancing cultural healing. And she said, you know, she was of Jewish descent and she said she was amazed at the light in that city. And after two weeks of wandering around, decided it was the public art. So I'm curious about um, the place that New Zealand finds itself in and the need to stimulate um, greater leadership, greater uh, courage, greater um, capacity to act without permission. And any thoughts that any of you may have to share about that with respect to this moment of incubation nation? Um, I spoke to a gentleman once who was walking on the waterfront in Auckland and he, he said, that work of art there helps me know who I am, helps me know where I am in relation to the world. Um, this is how I know I'm a citizen. This is my reference point. Uh, and, you know, and in a much wider definition of art, we've also got built environment and place. We've got this beautiful place, which has got interventions, art interventions through it that help make the place. So we're, we're in brand new country, you know. Um, well, depending on how you look at it. Uh, and in terms of our built environment, we're a brand new country, and we're still putting um, works of art into it. And every time one goes in, then we know more about who we are as a citizen. And one of the most powerful things about art, of course, is it carries with it, a, um, good art carries with it some truth. And we need truth all the time. Uh, in and around us, we need to hear it, we need to feel it. Um, you know, I've kind of lost faith with documentary, I find, you know, you can interview someone, ask them a question, and then go away and then re record the question. So the answer is, you know. But I love mockumentary because, because artists are looking at the human condition and almost like a caricature amplifying, you know, who somebody is and heading towards the truth. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but um, I think, you know, New Zealand, just like every other nation in the world, is, is using art for all of those for all of those things, and um, pretty dedicated to being more and more of it. And, and just to add to that, um, where I see enormous opportunity, and where I was really quite excited by your comment, is in New Zealand and also other major cities around the world, a lot of the art pieces have come from an activism place of that reflection and a place of pain. And what I really liked about what you said is, what are the opportunities coming from a place of healing and looking into the future and what could be? So um, I think that's something just to reflect on. Yeah. I think uh, just in, in response to the word healing, I've discovered uh, uh, art can do that too. Um, some of the rap band, little our, our young fellas on the marae that have, um, you know, life's led them astray. 
Um, they come from um, families that don't have boundaries. This is just a personal observation now, okay? And mum and dad haven't got boundaries, so there's no boundaries set in the house, so these young fellas grow up and, and they're, they're issues. They're high-maintenance, muscled-up little dudes running around causing chaos. And so as a consequence, they end up coming down to the marae and they have to be part of the crew that does that. But what I've found is once they're sweating, the, they, they seem to intellectually uh, kick in and start asking questions. So, you know, a question that I often have is um, they ask me questions about their culture. And it's through, through the carvings in the... In the um, I get told off heaps by the um, probation officers because instead of mowing lawns, they're all in the carving shed with me having a thought at all about the symbolism of the, cult, of, of, the, of the carvings. But for me, I get a lot of, I can see a lot of movement kicking in when I start talking about um, the symbolisms that we have. You know, why, they, why there's this tattoo on them or, or that, that carving has got a tattoo here and everything like that. So it's quite, for them, it's quite, I can tell it's quite liberating for them to understand the cultural symbolism that was all around them but they don't, that no one's ever told them about. You know, look, one I found was very powerful at the time, kicked off the, um, the, the, the sculptural piece that I've left here with you guys to look after, which was um, a simple fish hook, you know. And they, they uh, were in there, we had a, one of our whakairo on the wall was Maui. And they, they said to us, oh, you know, that's up there with the three little piggies. You know, ha, 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 ha. And that, that story has potency in itself, the three little piggies, you know. <laughs> and the same with uh, the other one, uh, Little Red Riding Hood, yeah. Stranger Danger. Yeah. All of those yeah. things that we give to our children and everything, you know. So when, he, when it came to uh, Maui, I said, the symbolism of the fish hook, because he was holding a big fish hook, the symbolism there is that when you travel over the Pacific Ocean, Te Moana Nui Akiwa, that islands and clouds literally rise up out of the, out of the uh, circumference of, it, you know, of the ocean. So that the old people, because we didn't have a written language, symbolism and metaphors became a huge thing for us to impregnate issues of identity into our people. So the idea of a man pulling up a fish and that turning into land is truly a, a myth. It's a myth and a legend that, that conjures up amazing muscled up heroes and pictures and those images they will remember. Um, but really the idea of, of that a whole metaphor in itself, really what we talk about is that Maui travelled over the circumference of Te Moana Nui Akiwa and discovered Aotearoa because the land rose up off the, off the horizon. And um, the, f then they started getting that because it had real significance. The symbolism that they were looking in the meeting house had real significant, hands-on significance for them. And there were, there were many more stories like that that um, I was able to share with them. And... Um, and then the probation came around and said, right, get to work. Right, hang on, hang on, I'm not finished. But there are many other stories like that. And that's where I believe art can be a, have a healing nature. And some of these boys, one of them has gone to the um, carving school in um, Rotorua to learn. Other boys have um, taken up multiculture in the schools. You know, so... Just to, as a quiet observer, it's, it's really um, liberating for me to see the, how, how art and our culture can have an influence on the rat bags of our communities. Mm. I'm not actually sure what my question is, but um, I think coming from the United States of America, we have a, a very young culture. And um, I've done a bit of traveling in the world, and um, New Zealand has a rich, rich culture. Um, 
that goes back pretty far. And you guys have a lot of symbolism. And I work with design and branding and communication. And I think um, something that we all strive to do, those of us who work in, in this industry, we're always trying to find a symbol that can encapsulate a lot of meaning. And there's some relationship between symbolism and storytelling that you find in, uh, in all ancient cultures of antiquity. And um, Maori art is, is, is um, certainly rich with that same kind of symbolism that you were just describing, where you're, you're, you're sort of telling this, this story that's rich with metaphor and all kinds of meanings, and then there's meanings to be derived from it based on who you are. And um, I guess my question is just, um, uh, how, how do we develop our own sort of symbolism and storytelling? What are some of the ways that we can um, learn from that methodology, that, that, that sort of way? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I think some of the, the um, ways that you could learn would be just, just to listen to the indigenous voices of different peoples and try to look at them with, say, just for example, the boys I was talking to in the carving shed, I had to take their Western lenses off and, and create old school Polynesian lenses for them to, to see it. And then it came alive. So perhaps like my apprentice is from Argentina. He's an Aji. And... Um, his symbol is, is the puma, because in Patagonia it's, they have the puma there and the condor. And um, he's starting to look at it now with uh, the, I forget their name, the indigenous people of that area. It's given him a different um, insight, because when he goes back home he'll be carving, but trying to emulate the stories and the symbolism of, of that particular area. I think that's where it's at. It's just using our ears and um, opening our hearts. You know, much like what's going on around here this these few days. So is it? Do you relate to that? <laughs> what have you got to say about that? Oh, that's a big challenge. Being being a Pakeha and thinking about, um, say, for example, use of Māori symbols um, in a Pakeha world. Uh, well, it's not just a Pākehā world, of course, it's a Ma Māori and a Pākehā world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but as a Pākehā, so, um, yeah, it can be really challenging. Uh, for example, I had a trustee of the Arts Foundation, Sir Hugh, Sir Hugh Kafaru, Paramount Chief of Ngāti Pātua, and um, he would tell me stories about Pākehā moving in a, in a Māori world to help me, help me navigate it. And he, he, I was going on to Marae and I would need to speak and he said, um, are you nervous? And I said, well, I am nervous. And he said, well, you cannot be anywhere nervous, nervous as a young Māori person because a young Māori person is expected to know the language, but you're not. So that was a helpful thing to learn. And then he said, the best way forward is to understand all the, uh, the customs or the, or the ceremony as best you can use some words to acknowledge the space um, out of respect. And then within the context of, of what I understood about Māridim, use my own language. So be myself in that context, in that place of respect. Um, and I think that's been a really good um, founding stone for me. Um, and the other thing is to never um, say you over there or other or them over there, or, hey, I've got a favour for you because I'm going to use a bit of your culture and bring it into the mainstream. Those things are just re again. Um, so there needs to be a genuine partnership. Uh, and the partnership isn't just about the, the, the symbols, and I know that you know this, and it's also not just about the stories, but it's the way of thinking, the pace. Um, we have a trustee uh, at the Arts Foundation called Derek Lardelli, um, He's just amazing, man. It's my tamoko. If you want to, I'll take my shirt off, show you my tamoko from Derek Lydell. It's amazing. Oh, did I say that? No, that's what they're doing. Um, oh, show them, show them. I can see part of it. Only if Rebecca takes my shirt off. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hold it. You have to tell them what it means. Woo! Zook. 
Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. You got a pretty ass boy. My pants are still on. I'll take my pants off if Brownie takes my pants off. There's a, there's a good bit of symbolism. Strictly native. That's native to the area. Now I've lost my train of thought. I, I, I think, um, oh, I know what it is. Um, so Derek in the, the board meetings listens, listens to all the kōrero, all the talk, you know. And then at the end, speaking in Māori, which is the way he thinks, he will speak very quickly in the language, and it sounds like music. And you understand him, and then he, and then he, change, and then he, um, he translates it into English, in, into English for us as well. But there's a whole different way of thinking. So it's the stories, the symbolism, but being with the people to get the way of thinking and the pace and the insights, and, and, and it's, it's just so rich. It's, un, un, it's unbelievably rich, and it's such an ele- uh, you know, important part about living in, in this country. You know, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> yes. thank you for it. This is really inspirational, creative, great discussion. So thank you both very much. Thank you.